Hello everyone, welcome back to the show. My name's Dan, this is Exploder, and I'm back with another episode just for you. I took a week off last week, quite frankly, no excuses, just a scheduling conflict. And now I'm back with an episode that you can listen to with your ears at your convenience, because I did the work, you can have the fun. In this episode, I want to talk about the history of a professional wrestling company. It's one that's really not on the top of people's uh, lips or tongues, as it were. It's not something people talk about all that often, but it still exists, and it's still out there, and it has actually a pretty colorful history. So that's why in this episode, I want to talk about the history of Ring of Honor. Ring of Honor started, one of the reasons it started was because of something that happened in 2001. In 2001, both WCW and ECW went out of business. Now there's a lot of fallout from that. There's the invasion angle the, that failed miserably. There was all these different things. One of the pieces of fallout from this was to a little company called RF Video. RF Video was owned by a guy named Rob Feinstein. And believe me, that name's gonna come up very quickly. Rob Feinstein did a lot of the fan cam stuff and recorded the shows for ECW. Now, ECW is out of business. Its assets have been sold or would eventually be sold to the WB. Now, RF Video, their biggest seller was ECW Videos, and now they have no videos, quite frankly. They can still sell the old RF Video stuff, but they couldn't sell anything new because there was no new ECW shows, as you would see the problem here. So Rob Feinstein decided he was going to try and become part of CZW, which was sort of the Kmart secondary knockoff of ECW. The problem with this was, I guess CZW didn't want anything to do with them. It was still run by John Zandig at the time. For whatever reason, it didn't work. So the next option was, screw it. Rob Feinstein decided he was going to start his own promotion. And that promotion was going to become Ring of Honor. He hired, or I guess the co-founder as it were, was a ECW office personnel and Paul Heyman protege named Gabe Sapolsky, who became the booker and the lead announcer for the promotion, at least initially. The first few shows were set up like in Super Indie. It was, you know, when it, the time where Eddie Guerrero was not probably in his best shape, but was let go from the WWE. Uh, um, Ring of Honor brought him in and had him work with Super Crazy. The main event of the first show was a three-way match between Low Key, Brian Danielson, the American Dragon, and Christopher Daniels, who were at that time three of the hottest guys on the indies at the time. Both Dragon and Low Key had already had developmental deals with WWE back when developmental deals weren't handed like, hounded out like candy, it seems. They had already signed and been cut, I guess, and so this was the so the main event was, was that first show. They were set up originally like super indie shows before eventually becoming part of their own their own identity which will I'll, I'll come in there Sapolsky like I said an alter ego on commentary by the name of Jimmy Bauer and the other announcer for at least the first couple DVDs was Steve Carino coming off the failure of ECW and the fact that he had signed with WCW and never debuted. The ECW made ECW different was the fact that there was a thing called a code of honor. That was a big thing. Initially, this was the big idea behind the company. There would be an honor system among the competitors and that's how you did it. The first, There were rules of the code of honor. The first was you must shake hands before and after every match. That was very important to the whole thing. You'd shake hands, that whole thing. No outside interference, no sneak attacks, no harming of the officials, and any action resulting in a disqualification violates the code of honor. Now, it's not to say these things didn't happen, but it was sort of this built-in morality play, I guess. It was the idea of, okay, here are the rules, so anyone who broke those rules would be by default a heel. You're not gonna see many baby faces break the handshake rule, or the interference rule, or the sneak attack rule, or hitting a referee, or seeing other things. So it was a kind of thing where you not only have the good and evil of wrestling, now you have a built-in honor system so that the heels, the be the biggest of the heels, would violate it. Matter of fact, Christopher Daniels, starting from the first show, his whole thing was built around the fact that he didn't follow the code of honor. So after the main event, the three-way match between them, Low Key and American Dragon went to shake hands, and Christopher Daniels wouldn't shake hands. So this is from day one, this is from match, this is the main event of the first show, you set up this super heel who doesn't even follow the code of honor. And it's sort of weird by something that's sort of created for that show or for that promotion, but it got over very quickly and it became a sign. Now he of course would start a group called The Prophecy and their whole gimmick was everyone in the group did not follow the code of honor and that would include guys like BJ Whitmer, Dan Moff, Allison Danger, none of them would follow the code of honor because that was just what they did. And what's really interesting about it is, with the promotion, there were actually some heels, some bad guys, who would follow it. They'd be a bad guy, but they would, at least tentatively, shake your hand at the beginning of the match, and they'd shake your hand after, even if they were a little upset about it. Matter of fact, the angle, the idea of the code of honor was so important that they would have angles that would build to, like, the most ruthless, the most drawn out, the, the guys who just as far as angles go, could not stand each other, they would finish their feuds in what they called a fight without honor, which is a fight that where the code of honor did not apply. 
So that would often involve interference and cheap shots and a sneak attacks and ref bumps and all these different things. There was no handshaking. These are feuds that went homicide and Samoa Joe is a good example of a feud that just went on and on and on. And these two, as far as the angle goes, could not stand each other. So of course, the best way to finish something like this is with a fight without honor where forget the rules, forget the handshakes, just two guys beating the crap out of each other. And that is how they put over this code of honor. Now the code of honor would eventually be taken away. Uh, Gabe Sapolsky felt like it did run its course. They later simplified it and brought it back. It To me, and all that stuff, it's irrelevant. It's just the minutiae. It's a little inside baseball. But I mean, the idea behind it was really interesting. <laughs> The first problems for Ring of Honor arrived in um, in early 2004 when ROH co-owner Rob Feinstein was busted by a local um, to catch a predator type sting where he was apparently soliciting or allegedly uh, soliciting a sexual hookup with what he thought was a teenage girl, I guess. Uh, all I, it wasn't like a, it wasn't to catch a predator like Chris Hansen, like national TV. It was like a local one. But it doesn't, he says that nothing happened. He said there was no charges. And often with these groups, quite frankly, these groups sort of work outside the law, even the ones that are uh, doing it on TV. So they tend, the reason there's no conviction is because there's a chain of evidence. There's a way things have to be done for the legal process. And quite frankly, in their their intent to get the person, they tend to sort of gloss over things that are sort of important you can't gloss over. So he admits, he says there was no charges brought against him which is true he would never spend a day in jail for it but he did show up to the house so it doesn't look good either way march 2004 he resigned from ring of honor he sold his stock um his part of the company to a guy named doug gentry who was also worked for our video i think he was a co-founder and doug gentry eventually would sell his stake to carrie silken a uh, local businessman think like Think like Todd Gordon, but less likely to be in an orgy. Like, that's the best way to explain Kerry Silken. In the aftermath of this, TNA, who had been allowing guys like um, AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels, who had been working for TNA by this point, uh, they pulled those guys. AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels were both about to win titles, as it seemed, and they were pulled immediately. So there's some fallout from this. But, and from this point, I mean, after Rob Feinstein's gun, and this was not a good thing, but it wasn't really, it changed the company, but it wasn't as negative as it could have been. It could have ended the company in all honesty, but it didn't. So it really what happened was they went from doing everything through RF video, doing the uh, doing the shows, and then putting the shows out and selling it through RF video. They started doing everything in-house. So they did the, the, instead of you doing an RF video shoot, they would do a straight shooting series. That's what they called it. It was a straight shooting series. It's hard to say a lot real fast, but they would do, promise, they would do uh, matches, they would do their shows, and they put it out through their own website. And really, that's really what changed. Kerry Silken brought a business perspective to it, and it's actually expanded under his leadership. Around this time, they also started a thing called the ROH Wrestling Academy, where they would create a training camp within the doors. They were actually in, they were based in Philadelphia, but they were actually in Bristol, Pennsylvania. So if you ever got a DVD back then, you were getting it from Br Bristol, Pennsylvania. And I had a bunch of those DVDs. Well, in the building where they were making the videos and things like that, they also had enough room to set up a ring. And they set up a ring and then they'd pay somebody full time to be the trainer. And guys like... Good former head trainers of this include guys like CM Punk, Austin Aries, and Brian Danielson, aka, for those of you who don't know, Daniel Bryan. So I think that's a pretty good group to be in. Uh, it's now called the ROH Dojo, and it's headed by Delirious, who, again, I'll get into why he's important. Trainees in the Academy were often a uh, ring crew for the shows and would face off against each other on shows for what they call the top of the class trophy, where the winner behind the scenes was decided by their trainer. So it was sort of this nod like, okay, as of right now, you're the trainee who's done the best. You're doing the best progress and so on and so forth. They would eventually be integrated into the show themselves. Um, there was a character like Bobby Dempsey. Bobby Dempsey was a, was a bigger guy, but he could he could run. He had good, decent enough cardio. He became the... Uh, poor picked on fat kid and sweet and sour enterprises Rhett titus uh would form the all-night express with tough enough runner-up and male stripper kenny king and mitch franklin who would originally wrestle with mitch franklin would literally at one point become the wrestling lumberjack grizzly redwood and another guy named pelly primo who was known for being very small but very agile and he was the kind of guy you could do a lot of spots to that other guys didn't because he was so small, so it was really so like a Spike Dudley dynamic there. One of the interesting angles at the time was they would have these groups of guys. They they worked with guys like Jersey All Pro Wrestling, 
So they'd bring people in for these angles, and, and some of the, inch, the beginning angles around 2003, 2004 were interesting. Well, you had guys like Homicide and Samoa Joe and Christopher Daniels and American Dragon. You also had a bunch of smaller, lesser-known guys sort of given these prominent roles. One of them was a thing called Special K. Special K was a group of guys from Jersey All Pro. Whether uh, they all had Nick, all their names were based on something to do with drugs. That was the joke. They were club kids, you know, the Michael Alleg party monster types. There were 30. 40 members at some point or another, but they all had some kind of nickname. They had Dixie and Izzy and uh, Yayo, which is slang for cocaine. They had Hydro, which would be later become Jay Lethal. And they were all a bunch of Jersey All Pro kids who were brought in and they would literally rave to the ring and they'd have parties and everything. And they were straight up heels because they were played off as these rich kid ravers and they were also played as like the opposite of what the Code of Honor was, which is why they would get into fights with guys like H.C. Uh, Loke and Tony DeVito, who were part of a group called the Carnage Crew, who were guys who wore, like, Tank Abbott-type shorts to the ring and T-shirts. They just got in the ring and beat the crap out of you. So, that was really interesting. I, I like that angle. It was it ran for a while, but it was very interesting. And like I said, they would sort of switch people out in, in and out, but I, I like that angle. One of the more interesting, and then talking about angles, one of the more interesting angles they would bring along would be the group Generation Next. They were going to do a show, Ring of Honor a couple times would have a show, and something would happen like any indie. There would be a show where something went wrong, and they'd have to rent a tent and put the tent right outside the building and do the show from the tent. This happened a few times in their in thing for different reasons, whether it was a double booking or they actually outgrew the capacity of the building or whatnot. This was one of those shows, and the idea of Generation Next was that there was going to be a there was going to be a, a a series of matches featuring young talent, and the fans would have a ballot and they'd vote on what they thought was the best match, and the best match would get a consideration to come back for another show. Well, I don't know if this was ever the plan initially, or if they just decided, or, or I don't know if this was the plan and they switched on it, or if they were going to do this from day one. But whatever it was. At the beginning of the show, four guys come to the ring. Austin Aries, Jack Evans, Roderick Strong, and Alex Shelley. They came to the ring with the uh, bag of these ballots and officially announced they weren't going to do the ballot system. They weren't going to do it. Not only were they not going to wrestle each other, they were going to wrestle as a team. And then that team got together against John Walters, Jimmy Rave, and the Briscoe brothers. Mark and Jay Briscoe, not the other ones. That would have been weird. And they had an eight-man tag that actually got a lot of time and was actually really good. They would form a group called Generation Next, and this would become a major angle for the company all through throughout the rest of 2004, well into 2005. Generation Next was like that: four guys who were young and exciting, and they had different they had different things that made them. Alex Shelley was more of a technical wrestler. Austin Aries had a striking and, and uh, striking ability. He was sort of a smaller guy, but a great striking ability. Very explosive with, with, his, with his stuff. Jack Evans is a high flyer who, even in, and this is 2004, even at this time was doing things I'd never seen before. And I watched a lot of wrestling, and I still do. And Roderick Strong probably knows 3,000 variations of the backbreaker, as you know if you watch NXT. Uh, literally called the Messiah of the Backbreaker. This was a very important angle. These guys would go. Now, this would go to the end of the year. Meanwhile, in all of this, they have a champion with Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe at this time, uh, Gabe Sapolsky liked the idea of the long-term champion, establishing a champion. The first champion of Ring of Honor was Low-Key. Low-Key would drop it to Xavier. Xavier would drop it to Samoa Joe. This would be early in 2002. Samoa Joe would not lose the belt until December of 2004. He would hold the title for going on two years. I'm not sure exactly what the dates are, but it was close to two years this guy held this belt, and he faced everybody. That includes a trio of matches with a trilogy of matches, as it were, with CM Punk, one of which occurred in Dayton, one of which occurred in um, Chicago, and I can't remember where the third one happened. But this was a hell of a series of matches. This is the guy who fought everybody and anybody. They go to Final Battle, which is their yearly end-of-the-year pay-per-view, or not pay-per-view, but end-of-the-year event, as it were, although it did become a pay-per-view a couple times. And two things happened that night, which is very interesting. Very interesting, and this is, this is almost ECW-style booking. Earlier in the night, Alex Shelley, who was the de facto leader of the group and had been the um, the speaker of the group for the whole time, is summarily kicked out of the group. There was a, I can't remember the full angle, but there was an angle, and they kick him out of the group, and he's no longer in the group. Then that night, Austin Aries, who was considered sort of the number two, sort of the co-president or, or vice president, as it were, defeats Samoa Joe to win the Ring of Honor title. So in one night, he goes from the second banana and a challenger to being the head of the group and the Ring of Honor world champion. And again, that's an ECW way to do it, but it's it's really interesting. And I, I always like that. 
And yes, I have I have a lot of these DVDs, and I have Final Battle 2004 on DVD in my collection. So if you ever get a chance, it's hard to find some of these DVDs because they're so old, and there are a lot of them are out of print. Uh, but they're very interesting. They're really good, and you're seeing wrestling uh, an issue that you'll see later on. But you're seeing the the beginning of a lot of guys. Uh, the beginning of their careers or when they're first coming to prominence and you're seeing a lot of guys that are in AEW and WWE right now. Austin Aries has come and gone in, in WWE, but guys like Jack Evans are on AEW, Roderick Strong's in NXT, Alex Shelley had a couple run. I mean, he's had more than a couple runs in TNA, um, went to Ring of Honor, left, came back, so on and so forth. But you're, you're actually seeing the beginning of these guys. And it's something that's really interesting to see now, but it's also becomes part of the Ring of Honor problem, as it were. There's a lot of talents early on that you see that were integral to the company as they're growing, but now, honestly, are names that people, nobody knows. One's John Walters. John Walters was a very, he was a Boston guy, a very straight lace, probably, and I don't mean in this way, I don't mean in that way, but he puts you in the mind of like a Chris Benoit, sort of a, sort of just like a, a hard-hitting guy, a hard-hitting, grizzled type. Very important to the company for a few years there. I mean, he was really good. A good mid-card guy. They were tag teams like the Outcast Killers, which include Diablo Santiago and Omar Tartuga. The guy named Dan Moff. Dan Moff is a big... I don't know if he's... I, I'll be honest with you. I think he's Hispanic. Not that it matters, but I think he's Hispanic. But he's a big... If you didn't know any better, you'd probably think he was this big Samoan guy. Big guy. Uh, he left in... He was a tag team champion when he left the company after some controversy with him and Homicide. I don't know the full story. I'm not getting into it. But they sold it as he was in a car accident. But he literally... Homicide went to the promoter and said, If you book him, I quit. So whatever it was because Homicide helped train Dan Moff, so it was a personal betrayal, whatever the hell it was. But Dan Moff actually returned, is returning to Ring of Honor, returned after a 14-year absence, which is amazing to even think about for a guy to be at that position 14 years later to even to be even physically able to come back. That's pretty awesome. And not only was Gabe Sapolsky the booker of Ring of Honor, he was also the booker of something called Full Impact Pro, which ran out of Florida. The didn't mean Ring of Honor. Ring of Honor was more of a self-supporting, live event, bigger arenas, and I mean not huge arenas, but you know, uh, between 800 to 1,000 people, and it looked different. FIP was built as more of like an old studio wrestling show. They had the, uh, inter while Ring of Honor would have the, inter the interviews backstage as like a DVD type thing, or a television product, Full Impact Pro had a interview set right by the entranceway. And there'd be a lot of overlap, whether it was Homicide or CM Punk or so on and so forth. Some guys would cross over and things. One one famous one, of course, a little aside, was where Homicide and CM Punk fought their way through a strip club, uh, literally into a strip club, and apparently there was some conflict between CM Punk and a stripper, and Punk was told to apologize, and he was going to, and then she said something else smart to him, and he just didn't apologize. Long story. <laughs> just a little aside there but yeah so while he's doing this he's also doing fip which is different and they would have some crossover they'd bring in guys from this and there you know chase and rance would come up or kenny king actually started in fip and then would eventually come up to the uh, come in later as the all night express on in ring of honor they would eventually do the CZW angle of uh, Combat Zone Wrestling, still owned by John Sandig, would bring in his Ring of Honor, bring in his CZW guys, which included guys like, and then there was some some overlap, but it was a lot of very on the point. And some of the guys that did cross over, there was a overlap. They mentioned it. Claudio Castagnoli was a big overlap, and they may mention that. But they, uh, John Zandig would bring in guys like Necro Butcher, who is, I cannot imagine a guy more opposite of Ring of Honor fans, which, by the way, they would eventually fall in love with, which I don't quite understand. I still don't. Necro Butcher, guys like Nate Webb, John Zandig, um, I'm trying to think. I mean, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of CZW guys would come in and they would have match. Super Dragon was a good one. Super Dragon was brought in and they would have an angle against each other. And it was built as an invasion. So it was built as two promotions who were having a war with each other. And it would have guys from Ring of Honor, representing Ring of Honor, wrestle in CCW. They would have guys from CCW invade Ring of Honor, attack them, put them to tables, and so on and so forth. The entire angle would go on for a while and end with a match that was a war games rules type match, you know, heel, babyface, coin toss, someone comes out, yada, yada, yada. But it was done in CZW's Cage of Death, which is, if you've never seen it before, it's a black rimmed cage. 
It's like it's like the cage you'd see like a lion tamer at a, at a county fair. It, it's really it's the best thing I can think. It's this big wire cage. The, the actual bars are are thin and they're made and they're in this case they're yellow because yellow and black is their colors. And it, that was the way to blow off the angle. And then they also did one more. They had Necro Butcher and B.J. Whitmer in a barbed wire match. One of the only one of the only barbed wire matches the company ever did. And it was in uh, the Montgomery County Fairgrounds in Dayton, Ohio, which is affectionately called The Oven by fans. I've been to that show, but I I've been to that arena for, um, it's part of the county fairgrounds is what it is. It's like an exhibit building. And they would curtain off part of it and do wrestling shows there. And I've always went in the colder months, so I never noticed. But during the summer, it's called The Oven because it's very, very hot. And these two had a barbed wire match in a very, very hot place called The Oven, and Necro Butcher wrestles barefoot. So, and he wrestled barefoot and without a shirt in a barbed wire match because he's a very smart man. Ring of Honor would actually then make their way onto pay per view, traditional pay per view for a company at the time who was, I mean, they were doing okay, but pay per view was probably not the best avenue for them. I don't know the numbers on them. They seem to do okay, but I do know that the pay per views didn't last. They didn't, they were on pay-per-view and then for a while and then they weren't. One of the more interesting angles they did, talking about like a random angle, one of the more interesting angles they did was after their Man Up pay-per-view, which involved uh, a ladder match between the Briscoes and Kevin Steen and El Generico. After the match was over, uh, for, for months up to this point, there had this thing called Project 181. And it was these cryptic videos and these guys wearing ski masks and it was never explained. And the pay-per-view goes off the air. The pay-per-view goes off the air. That's how interesting this is. This is a very particular thing as far as the angle goes. The pay-per-view goes off the air with the Briscoes winning the match. As they go off the air, three people jump the rail. One is the Necro Butcher. Uh, this is a while after the CZW angle. Two is Tyler Black, who is now known as Seth Rollins. Uh, who was making a name for himself in the Indies at the time. And the third was Jimmy Jacobs, who had previously on Ring of Honor Television had been the lovesick puppy who loved uh, uh, his manager, who was a girl named Lacey. And they jump in the ring and they beat them up and they ended up hanging one of the Briscoes. I, I want to say Jay, because Jay tends to bleed a lot more than Mark, but whatever. Hangs him by his ankles and hoists him up. So now, instead of like the tag team titles hanging from the ring or whatever, they have one of the Briscoes hanging from there. And Briscoe, and I don't know what, I don't know if he took the Bruiser Brody special or whatever, but he's bleeding. And Jimmy Jacobs is standing there and he's wearing a white coat and one of the Briscoes' blood is pouring out of him and it's landing on Jimmy Jacobs' jacket. So this blood, it, legit, and this is real blood, this is legit blood pouring onto Jimmy Jacobs. And he's doing this promo. And this is a group they formed called the Age of the Fall. And this group would eventually add a couple members. It would add Delirious, uh, a woman named... Well, Lacey would come onto the group, sort of a different character, add Alice in Wonderland, and, and create this group. Now, this is beginning... This was sort of during the Faction Wars, where Generation Next, who we talked about earlier, Generation Next would break up, and people would sort of go in their own ways. It would end with Jack Evans forming his own group called the Vulture Squad with uh, Jigsaw and Ruckus which was, it's a weird name and it's a weird group. And then for whatever reason, Homicide's manager, Julia Smokes, I don't know. Roderick Strong would turn on Austin Aries. He would form a group called the No Remorse Corps with Davey Richards and Rocky Romero, which is a really cool group. Put up some really cool t-shirts. I still have their first one and I love it. And Austin Aries would film his own, form his own group with Matt Cross and Eric Stevens called The Resilience. The problem with the resilience is Austin Aries was also signed to TNA at the time and would disappear. So he forms the group and then disappears for a few months. Mm. Jack Evans forms a Vulture Squad and then he goes to Japan for a few months. So the only one that was still working at the time was the No Remorse Corps. And it was a good group, you know, but I digress. The Repo Man took the Blacktop Bullies truck. Who reported it? We did. It's Newsflash. Bobby Lashley and Lana got fake married on Raw in a segment that went longer than the usual Brock Lesnar match. The fake groom and bride are said to be happy, but they are the only ones. The Miz and CM Punk got into a Twitter exchange where The Miz mocked CM Punk's change the culture phrase, while Punk said something extremely true, but wouldn't make air on Fox. Wrestle Kingdom 14 was held recently, or as Vince McMahon calls it, WrestleMania 37. After many years off the shelves, WWE ice cream bars are making a return to a store near you, featuring all of your favorite WWE stars. The Brock Lesnar one will only be available four times a year. The Braun Strowman one will be very large, but ultimately leave you disappointed. And the Daniel Bryan one will be vegan for some damn reason. The Bray Wyatt one will just be a rat. That's all for this time. Now let's get back to the show. 
The Age of the Fall would last for months and eventually end with Jimmy Jacobs. Uh, Jimmy Jacobs and Tyler Black would win the tag team titles and then would eventually break up like all groups do to the infighting and eventually where Jimmy Jacobs and Tyler Black were, they were building an angle where Jimmy Jacobs and Tyler Black would have a single shoot and then just randomly it ended. And later on, and I saw Jimmy Jacobs live at other shows during this time, and it turns out, and I'm not making rumors, this is exactly what happened, this is what he himself has said, what happened was in the middle of this, uh, Jimmy Jacobs had developed and was continuing a serious drug problem, and finally it got to the point where Ring of Honor was just sick of it. And so when he disappeared from the angle, when he just was, he left, that was real. He left because they just fired him, because he was becoming a trouble to deal with. And he admits that, there were times where he'd finish a match and then yell to the crowd and see if anyone had any pills. Like, he was just out of it, and he was worried. He was more worried about his drug issues than he was anything else. So it was sort of a it was a bad way to end the angle. And thankfully, Jimmy Jacobs is, as far as I know, clean now. I, I'm sure he is. And he's in a lot better place. I mean, this was years ago. I mean, this is not an indictment on the guy. This was years ago. This was, you know, 2008 or whatever it was. This was so many years ago. But that's really the age of the fall. It sort of fell apart because, A, they were building toward a single feud that never happened because of stuff behind the scenes. And you know, it happens. You know, that's wrestling. On October 26, 2008, ROH announced that Gabe Sapolsky was no longer the booker. He was no longer going to be working for Ring of Honor or FIP. Through his own admission, he just said he got burnt out. He was dealing with a lot of personal issues with his wife. Uh, I think what it was, it was sort of the burnout, and that was affecting his issues with his wife, so I, as I understood it. And it was something where it was just a clean break. He left, and at the time, he was just out of the business, and he was replaced by Adam Pierce. Adam Pierce would continue booking, um, and it changed a little bit the way they did things different. I mean, you know, Dayton, I used to go to shows in the, like I said, the oven, I used to go to Dayton and Dayton was always like, you, they would do a double shot. So instead of doing one show a month, they would do a few shows a month, but they would do a double shot. They'd do Dayton on Friday night and then they do Chicago on Saturday night because it was, you know, it was an okay enough drive. And usually like one night, uh, one time it was our second pay-per-view. The, se the pay-per-view was the next night. So they did an angle on Friday where Austin Aries, who had, at that time was working for TNA, um, yeah, he was working for TNA at the time, but he had gotten his release, but we didn't know that. They set up the angle where he was, someone, Roderick Strong came to the ring and called him out, and da 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 but it was, this is the guy who doesn't work for the company, supposedly. So they set that angle up, so the next night, but everyone at the time thinks this guy works for TNA, he's contract, he can't be doing anything. And they, they sold it. They turned the cameras off. They did a whole thing to be like, no, 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 this isn't part of the show. This is literally one guy trying to get himself over or whatever and get the company in trouble for dealing with a guy who legally cannot get in the ring. The next night, of course, he'd already got his release. The next night, uh, Austin Aries signed his new Ring of Honor contract, suppose, you know, kayfabe, in the ring. So on Dayton, they would do something in Dayton to set up something in Chicago. So Chicago was the A market, Dayton was a B market, but they would still sort of lead you there. They would do something to set up the next night. They'd do something to set up for a bigger show. After Adam Pierce took the book, and it's not a remark on Adam Pierce, but I did notice, I went to a couple of Ring of Honor shows in Dayton after Adam Pierce got the book, and I noticed that, quite frankly, they stopped doing angles in Dayton. Dayton was just, it was a show. And I don't know if that was just his inability to do it or if he made a concerted effort to be like, ah, it's just Dayton. Yeah, it's just a B market. Don't worry about them. We'll do what we need to do in Chicago. You know, and, and whatever. Again, this was years ago. I don't know. On January 26, 2009, Ring of Honor announced they were going to start a new TV show on HDNet, which is the TV network that is now Axis, which was started by uh, everyone's favorite TV shark, Mark Cuban, and they would have a weekly television show. That's a big expansion for them, for a company that at the time that was not on TV, was doing okay on pay-per-view, but not great. I, I don't know exactly when they stopped pay-per-views, but they weren't on pay-per-view for a long time. They had a few, and then they stopped. And then on August 15, 2010, they fired Adam Pierce and replaced him with Hunter Johnston, who is the guy who wrestles as Delirious, who speaks complete gibberish in shoot interviews and everything. He goes really extreme to keep that gimmick up, and I actually admire that. And January 11, 2011, these shows, these shows, there was an upgraded in production value and who they pushed and they put they brought a tv title in and things like that but in january 11 2011 ring of honor announced they were ending the ring of honor wrestling program after a two-year contract with hdnet had expired now th this whole time the owner of the company is Kerry silken who again got his stake his majority stake from doug gentry who got his who got that stake from Rob Feinstein, who was busted by, I don't know, Dime Store Chris Hansen. I don't know how that works. 
But so now he's the Carrie Silkins owned the company this whole time. On May 21st, 2011, Carrie Silkins sold the company to Sinclair Broadcasting Group, uh, which owns a bunch of TV stations across the country. I, I honestly, and I'm not a big TV insider, you know what I mean? So I didn't know much about the company at the time, but apparently Sinclair is, is a decent sized broadcast company, owns a bunch of TV stations, uh, affiliates around the country. So now that they own Ring of Honor, they're able to put Ring of Honor on these Sinclair owned TV stations all across the country and it's random it's Fox and because of these affiliates it's on at different times so Ring of Honor is on you know it's it's on the the affiliate where my dad lives it's on at like Sunday nights I don't know Sunday at 10 or something like that. it's random but it's it's syndicated it's basically it's syndication if you own the company and the TV station it's just that it's like synergy but it is it's syndication by you know with a little bit of leverage because you own both companies, you know. Now, about the time that Sinclair brought, buys them, there are a couple things that come up, and one of them was actually very surprising. The first thing that's not surprising is Jim Cornette has a problem. Jim Cornette at this time was brought in to work behind the scenes. He was brought to... It wasn't really the booker, but he was sort of the producer, so he was sort of writing the shows and putting things... And that's a guy who had a long history, so it makes sense to do that. It makes sense to put Jim Cornette in that kind of position. The problem was uh, Sinclair Broadcast Group comes along, and they send their people to run the business side of things. And their people apparently involve some kind of office guy. I can't remember what he said his name was, but there was some office guy that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, including uh, including guys like Adam Pierce, including Jim Cornette, including so on and so forth, was some kind of marketing guy who just thought he knew more than he did, and he's dealing with people that have been doing wrestling most of their adult lives. So that causes problems. It finally got to the point where Jim Cornette, who, Jim Cornette by this point was just ready to go, and he told a story of how one of their, I think it was an eye pay per view or whatever, one of their shows was almost cut because someone tripped over a cable because the power to the show was being run on a commercial, like Walmart supplied power strip. Like he started mentioning things like that. And then there's this big one online. If I can find it, I'll post it. It's not mine, it's a shoot interview he did, but it, it's actually a great indictment upon Ring of Honor on the kind of things they were doing behind the scenes, even though the product was actually still very good. Uh, it's this whole thing about Ring of Honor. I hope if I can find it, like I said, I'll post it on the page sometime this week. The other problem, which I was very interested in, I, I didn't expect this, was it seemed like their production value went down, which is amazing because they're owned by a TV company. And this is backed up by a lot of people behind the scenes are saying, well, it's kind of true because, well, because they were doing pretty much really cool, really cool stuff in Ring of Honor at the time. I mean, their their pro, pro, production value was good. I mean, I, I'm you know, you go to those shows, you'd see the hand cameras they were using and things like that. I mean, they weren't using the biggest, most professional cameras. I'm sure WWE's cameras are thousands of dollars more. But at the same time, Ring of Honor, for the, for the position they were in, they were doing okay, and their production value was pretty good, and their editing was pretty good. And it was like, so you think, okay, a TV company bought you, a broadcast company, well, then you're going to have access to better equipment you know, your production value is going to go up. And it seemed, at least at first, to go down. The video quality looked lower, and, and I don't know, 720p, 10, you know, 1080p, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get to the pixels, but you know what I mean? It seemed like it was just lower quality, the lighting looked worse, it looked like, I mean, it was somehow a independent company doing all these things for years, and then a broadcasting TV company buys it, and somehow it makes it look worse than it did. And I didn't understand that. And what I understand was, as things have been said, is that at the time, when they bought it, they were trying to cut costs. And one of the ways they cut costs was they started using cheaper equipment. And Jim Cornette, like I said, told a story about how one of their cameras literally broke apart on the guy's shoulder. The guy was carrying a, a camera, producing something, and the camera broke into two pieces. And one side went onto the front of him, and one side went to the back of him. The thing broke. So maybe, you know, they started using older equipment or less working equipment or whatever. So they were cutting costs and so on and so forth. Now that was changed. Originally, Ring of Honor, Sinclair started putting more money into it, and the production value went back up. But for a little bit there, man, it, it, it started looking awful. And I don't know what the plan was there. I don't know why you would buy something like that and then try to make it look worse before you even debuted on your own networks. To me, that does, that's a short-sighted view. And, and, and eventually they fixed that, and I'm thankful for that. The biggest problem with Ring of Honor is, well, quite frankly, it's the problem that ECW ran into all those years ago. They can't produce talent at the level or at the speed of that they're being taken. That's really the biggest problem. That's the problem of your own success. 
And, and, and it's something you can't avoid. I mean, that's really what it is. It, it, wrestling is one of those things where if you have a company and you build a certain amount of guys, eventually WWE, or now AEW, and it used to be WCW, but someone's going to come along who has a bigger budget, who has a bigger stage, who has brighter lights, who has better cameras, who has better microphones, who has more talent, who employs Hulk Hogan, is going to come along and say, hey, would you like to do what you're doing right now, but on TV for 10 times the money? And everyone who's in the business is going to go, um, yes, yes, I would. And then they leave. Now, if that happens occasionally, it's one thing. It's another thing when they take four or five guys a year. It happened in ECW. I mean, the guys like Mikey Whipwreck, The Sandman, Raven, Stevie Richards, The Public Enemy. You know, I could keep going. Shane Douglas. <laughs> Perry Saturn. There's so many guys that were gone. It, by the end of ECW, they were building guys, and they couldn't. And even at the end, they were building guys like Steve Carino and Jerry Lynn and Rhino. Well, Steve Carino did the, the what we found out later was the last ECW pay-per-view, Guilty as Charged 2001. He got signed by WCW. Lance Storm was signed, you know, a year before that. Shane Douglas was gone a year before that. I mean, Sandman left and came back. Raven left and came back. But then Raven left again. They couldn't build new stars quick enough as they were losing. They were losing people way quicker than they could build them. And that's the problem Ring of Honor has run into and is still having. These are the following people that have worked for Ring of Honor that have signed have been signed away to an exclusive contract. And this is just a short list. This is not everybody. This is just people I'm thinking off the top of my head. CM Punk, Brian Danielson, aka Daniel Bryan, Nigel McGuinness. First the TNA, he got signed to TNA uh, exclusive, and then he came back to Ring of Honor, and then he signed to WWE. Samoa Joe got signed to TNA exclusively. They did a uh, uh, during the fifth year. Um, during the fifth year festival, they did a tour of Samoa Joe's last matches. I saw his last match in Dayton for Ring of Honor at the time with him and uh, Davey Richards, where he kicked Davey Richards so hard, I heard a thump in the back of his head. I don't know how legit it looked legit. Let's put it that way. Kevin Steen, who's now Kevin Owens. El Generico, who is now Sami Zayn, if you believe the conspiracy theories. Mike Bennett, The Young Bucks, Tommaso Ciampa, Cody Sometimes Rhodes, Tyler Black, who became Seth Rollins. Chris Hero, who is now Cassius Ono, Claudio Castagnoli, who is now Cesaro, Adam Pierce, Brody Lee, who is now Luke Harper, or was Luke Harper, and now I don't know, and even recently, Punishment Martinez. This is just a short list of people that Ring of Honor has put time and money into and have left. The only guys who really haven't left, Jay Lethal went to TNA, came back, and Jay Lethal's been a standstill. But the other one, Roderick Strong. Roderick Strong was there forever. Roderick Strong was there from 2004 until he signed with WWE. But even he's gone now. Adam Cole is gone. Bobby Fish, Kyle O'Reilly, gone. I mean, these are people, look at all these people that are coming. I mean, they they even got like Sarah Del Rey, who worked for Sweet and Sour and, and was one of their top female wrestlers. She's a trainer at the Performance Center now. So the problem they have now is, and you're seeing the, their attendance is going down, their TV, I don't know what their TV does, I don't even know what their TV is expected to do, because it's Sinclair and it's on syndication, it's all over the place, right? But as far as live events, their their average attendance, according to Dave Meltzer, their attendance was their average attendance was 1,082 people, which was lower than 2018 and 2017. So their attendance is on average going down. Now they're dealing with stuff that can't build stars fast enough. They're losing atten their average attendance is going down. I'm sure they have big events, but they're losing attendance. And then in October of 2019, they ran into more problems. 2019 was not a good year for the company. Let's put it that way. ROH producer Joey Mercury, aka Joey Matthews, left the company and he, they say burning bridges. This guy had a flamethrower in a house of popsicle sticks. He burned a lot of bridges, but it was from a guy who'd been in the business for so long. I don't think he cares. And he tells how he thought the company had a lack of direction, how they don't have a concussion protocol. He talked about uh, the actually at the time ring of honor women's champion kelly klein was put in the ring with an obvious concussion which is not i don't know any company that would want to do that i don't care how big or small you are and kelly klein's contract was not renewed so the women women's championship is vacant and you know who knows that it'll be being reactivated but it's a company that it's running into a corporate problem and it's sort of weird when you have a company that does things a certain way when it's an independent company and then a broadcast company comes along and buys it. A, theoretically, a more corporate company that's w more worried about these public issues. And they seem to be running the place worse than it was when it was ran by a guy named Kerry. So th that's a problem. So now now their roster is an issue. Now the roster, I mean, the biggest guy on the roster right now, they have Marty Skrull, who's not on contract. He's being paid right now on a sort of a per appearance deal. He had a contract, contract was up. Um, Rush, I think and PCO. The heavyweight champion right now is PCO. Pierre Carl, uh, Pierre Carl Ouellette, um, 
who was also Jean-Pierre Lafitte, you know, the one-eyed pirate who really loved Bret Hart's jacket. He was one of the Quebecers, so, who was, I mean, he was a freak of nature, who was, it is, in his 50s, he's wrestling like he was in his 30s. It's amazing. But he's the heavyweight champion right now. And Marty Skrull's sort of coming in. But those are probably two of the biggest talents. I mean, the Briscoes are there. Briscoes are never going to leave, ever. They, they've been looked at, but they're never going to leave because they like doing their side business in Delaware, I believe it is. They raise pit bulls. I am not joking. That is their side job and has been for the past decade and a half. But they're never going to leave. Jay Lethal seems good there. I'm not saying he'd never sign with AEW or WWE, but I mean... So far, I'm sure he's had many op opportunities, and he doesn't. But outside of that, they're having trouble creating talent. They're having trouble creating stars at the rate or higher than the rate that they're losing them. And that's the biggest problem Ring of Honor is going to run into. These problems might get worse if more talent get disaffected. If they start cutting talent, and they start cutting names, and they start cutting contracts. Because this is the contract that AJ Styles, before WB signed him. They had Kevin Owen. They have Kevin Steen before WB signed him. They had Adam Cole before WB signed him. They had Mike Bennett. I mean, there were so many guys that were names that you know of names now that were names in Ring of Honor. They had, I mean, heck, they brought in guys like Shinsuke Nakamura. So they've done work with, you know, all these different companies. They've worked with, they've gone to Japan numerous times. They've worked with New Japan on different promotion, promotional things and things like that. But what they've learned recently is actually their biggest threat is now it's a two pronged threat. It used to be you only had to worry about losing your guys to WB. Now you got to worry about losing your guys also to AEW, who are offering exclusive contracts. So when a guy like PCO's contract comes up, he could go to WB. Probably not. He could. I don't think they'd sign him because just, if nothing else, because of his age, AEW would probably sign him. Marty Skrull. They are playing Marty Skrull on a deal like a pretty good deal as far as I understand it, but Cody Rhodes comes along and offers him an AEW deal. He'll be on national television. How long do you think he's going to stay in Ring of Honor? I mean, really. And this isn't a knock on the company. I like Ring of Honor. I, I was a much bigger fan years ago. I used to watch a lot of the DVDs. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I got off the I got off the wagon. I guess the way to, way to put it. I don't know how to put it. I mean, you know, I stopped watching as much as I used to. I like to know who's on there. But like I said, even now, there are guys right now that from they weren't there two years ago. They weren't there four years ago. I don't know who they are. I mean, it's not a knock on them. I'm not saying they're not talented. There are some very talented people there, I'm sure. But it's a star power thing, and that's their biggest problem. There's no stars. And if you can't create stars at the rate you're losing them, if you can't keep up, and you're, you know, right now your biggest star is Marty Skrull and PCO, and, you know, I'm sorry, and with all due respect, and I love Marty Skrull, but Marty Skrull's not going to carry a promotion. Jay Lethal is not going to carry a promotion if you want to expand. So the question now is... Are they going to stay at the rate they're at? Or are they going to sink? Because growth under the current system, under the current contracts, under the current style they have, is not going to happen. So are, have we seen the biggest Ring of Honor is ever going to get? Is, is it on the decline? Is it something that's going to last for, you know, a few more years? Is it going to last like TNA or Impact, whatever the hell? Is it going to last for 10 more years, but sort of just be there? That's the question. So that that's really the question. That's where I'm, it's an open-ended question, because I don't know. I, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't, you know, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I have some deep inside knowledge. I'm just asking as a fan. I'm asking as somebody who has a podcast where I talk about wrestling. I like Ring of Honor. I like its history. I say I, I, I want to do this episode because there's a lot of interesting history to it. But the question is, what about its future? I don't know. I hope it succeeds. I hope there's another place for guys to work. But at the same rate, if they're in the if they're in this situation two years from now, then honestly, outside of a place to work, what's the point? And that's where I'm going to leave it at that. I, I sort of let you decide. And I don't know. Post your comments. Let me know what you think. What do you think of Ring of Honor? What do you think Ring of Honor is going to be? Do you think it's going to grow? Do you think it's going to decline and sort of slowly fade away what do you think of what's going on what do you think of the talent and honestly who do you think who do you think are the biggest stars in the company right now is there anybody that you want to watch is there anyone that you tune into ring of honor to watch that i'm just not missing i, I could i'll admit that i can miss somebody I, i'm not gonna say that i'm the be all end all maybe there's somebody i'm overlooking maybe rush is really good i'm not knocking rush but i don't know anything about him maybe rush is really good so let me know what do, what do you think do you think i'm full of crap do you think that i'm just not seeing the brilliance of ring of honor in, in, in 2020 or 2020 or however the hell you say it maybe i'm missing it let me know so yeah leave a comment let me know what you think uh thank you for listening to this podcast i'm sure i've gone on a little long on this one not that it matters but i mean you know i i sort of have a standard and i'm sure this one's a little longer than average but that's gonna be it my next show stand up i do stand up if you are in the lime ohio area and i know most of you aren't but if you are i'm part of beans on parade go to brokendrift.com to get your tickets 
We are in a very, very new venue. We're actually one of the first shows at this venue called the Legacy Arts Building, still downtown, just across the street from Art Space. I think we're like one block down, but it's going to be a great show. We have some Brian Kenny, Kyle Honhorst, Buck Newman, myself. It's going to be a great show. Joey McDermott, it's going to be a great comedy show. Then we are doing Blackout Boxing. I will be promoting the hell out of this in the future, but Blackout Boxing at the Southside Spartans, the new gym they are at, at the 311 building right across from the railroad tracks. I am not performing that night. I am not going as a comic. I'm not going as a podcaster. I'm going as a promoter, and I'm going as a fan but that's going to be a really great show. It's going to be very interesting. So if you happen to be in earshot and you hear this and you live in the Lime area, check out those shows. So until next time, my name's Dan. This is Exploder. Have a good one.